one of the things that we've just been doing with the state of Oregon, um, I meet once a month with the superintendent of instruction for the state of Oregon. And part of what we're talking about is what can the state do to invest in and support effective practices. And it's, it's a really big deal. So if you're really going to narrow down and say what actually works, one of the things that I want you to think about, there's a name there at the bottom, Dr. Diana Carazales Engelman. She is the person in the Oregon Department of Education that you could write to, and she can send you this information. Part of what they've done is they've said, if we are going to invest as a state, right, and Oregon is about the size of some of your counties in terms of number of people, right? But if we're going to invest as a state in, what, in, in moving forward, any innovation we do, one, has to really focus on a core outcome, reading, math, behavior, writing, graduation. We're not going to focus, we're not going to do mass scale unless it, it for little things, right? Something like how to work with TH word attack, that's great, but it's too small. How to deal with dressing, very nice, but it's too small. We want to deal with things that are core outcomes for education. Second, they need to be defined with precision and clarity. Too often, we define stuff in global words that sound great, but you don't know what it actually means. Have you ever tried that? You know, people describe things, and you, you have this sense that what they mean is important, but you're not quite sure what it would look like. You need to be able to know what it looks like with a level of precision and clarity that works. They have to have demonstrated that it's practical. It's got to be more efficient than what we already do and more effective than what we already do. Don't adopt things that throw out stuff you already do well. One of the basic mantras, never stop doing what already works. And when we adopt things, most of the things that we're being asked to adopt, we already do 40% of. Don't throw out the things that we already do well. Do they have materials for professional development and monitoring of fidelity? I want you to come back. Remember that thing that you wrote down that's going to be on the exam? Do we measure on a regular basis if we are implementing what we said we would do? So think about, you all say we're doing RTI. RTI is not a thing you do. RTI is a framework. RTI is the organizational structure in which you put literacy, math, behavior. You do literacy instruction within an RTI framework. You do math instruction within an RTI framework. So if we're implementing something, can you show me that we actually have the, what are the core features of your early literacy program? Tell me about the curriculum. Tell me about the instruction. Tell me about the monitoring. Tell me about the degrees of intensity. How do we organize? How do you determine the combining of kids for reading groups? What's the rule that you use for doing it? Those are the, th what I want to know is, do we actually do those things, right? Are the practices actually evidence-based? And one of the things you should hold us accountable for, anybody who has the uh, presumption of coming before you and wearing a microphone when showing you slides, you should be able to say, where's the research, right? Where's the research that it makes it work? And is it consistent? This is something we don't pay enough attention to. Is it consistent with basic values? Don't ask people to do things that they believe are inappropriate. Don't ask people to do things that they fundamentally don't value. And the reason I want you to say that is anything that we do in education, we have multiple ways of doing. There's never one strategy. I want you to find the way of achieving the core features that makes it fit your context. Let me give you an example. So in behavior support, the three to five positively stated behavioral expectations, right? So you're going to teach, and the reason you're going to teach it, you're going to say, why are we teaching three to five positive state behavioral expectations? Because we want to create an environment that is predictable, consistent, positive, and safe. Right? You got it? All right. So you need to be able to say that the fast way. But what I really want you to think about is what are those three core concepts and how do we select them so that they fit our community, our faculty, our school? I was, I was doing a presentation on school-wide behavior support in New Mexico. And in um, southwest New Mexico, it's primarily uh, about half of the kids coming to school came from the Native American community. 
right? And so I did this thing about teaching three to five positive state behavioral expectations and being respectful, being responsible, being safe, trying hard. And after I'd done this and I thought I just did a whiz bang job, this guy came up to me and patted me on the back, which is a little bit inappropriate. And he <laughs> looked at me and he said, he said, this is all very well and good, but you gotta know, we've been doing this for 450 years, all right? Our Native American community has engaged in this for a long time. And I said, great, so what are the expectations? And the expectations were to be honorable, to be brave, right? They were things like that. So I said, great, let's be honorable and brave. What does it look like on the playground? What does it look like in the cafeteria? So we used the elders of the community to teach the core expectations, but the teachers organized the curriculum so the kids knew not just the words, but they knew what it meant. They knew what it meant for their behavior. That's an example of embedding things within the values and making it work. Now, part of what I'm gonna do, everything that I'm talking about stems from my experience with school-wide behavior support. You're gonna have different directions, but part of what I want you to think about, the reason why we are so committed, we're not committed to PBIS as a religion. We're committed to PBIS because it makes schools more effective learning environments. Everything that we hold dear at this conference is not about little labels, little strategies. It really comes back over and over again to are the things that we do making this school a more effective learning environment for the kids. Now, the reason why I want you to be excited about implementing school-wide behavior support is part of what we see is a reduction in problem behavior. In fact, if you implement PBIS with fidelity, we see a 20 to 60% reduction in the problem, in problem behavior, 20 to 60% reduction. So in one middle school that we worked with, that reduction resulted in savings. I want you to think about kids coming to the office, those of you who are administrators, I want you to think about the number of minutes you spend dealing with kids coming to the office. I want you to think about the kids, the number of minutes they spend out of class. So in one middle school in Oregon, that reduction resulted in savings of over 29 full days of administrator time. 29 full days. So one of my questions to that administrator is, what, what are you doing with those 29 days? Right, you just hanging out? I mean, no, I mean, seriously. No, I mean, and, and I want you to keep thinking. How many of you as administrators are thinking, you know, I really don't have anything to do today? <laughs> Not many, right? Okay, if you wanna add time, make your school a more effective learning environment. Second, the other thing I want you to think about, if we really want to make school a more effective learning environment, the single, the single most important variable about student achievement is the extent to which you increase the number of minutes they are academically engaged in effective instruction. I want you to deliver effective instruction and I want you to increase the minutes they are engaged. Sending kids to the office disengages. Remember that middle school? They recouped 121 full student days of instruction. 121 full student days of instruction. This is in a 532 kid middle school. So part of what I want you to think about is reduction in problem behavior. We get improvement in academic performance and we've actually done randomized controlled trials demonstrating that. But you don't get, come on, you don't get improved reading scores because you teach people to be respectful and responsible. You get improved reading scores because they're there when instruction occurs. So you only get the academic, the what the behavior support does is it gives you the opportunity for instruction to work. It's only if you actually have the effective instruction. Improved perception of school safety. Remember I want, this, I want, I want your kids to say it's predictable, consistent, positive, and safe. Safe emotionally and physically. I want people to feel that they are safe. I want, ask the children, to what extent do, the, do your peers treat you with dignity and respect? To what extent do the adults in the building treat you with dignity and respect? And then, when you ask those questions, I want you always to ask the third one. To what extent do you, cowboy, treat others with dignity and respect? 
because part of what we're teaching is we're teaching. This is really a democracy. You don't get something without a responsible alternative. You have. You are part of this community, and you get and you give. That's part of what we're teaching over and over again. The other thing that's really exciting, and I'll show you some data about this, is part of what we're also seeing is a reduction in staff turnover. Redu and this is not just because the economy tanked and nobody can get jobs. We actually saw this before that. <laughs> All right? And one of the things that we've just demonstrated, teachers in schools that use school-wide behavior support are more likely to identify themselves as being effective professionals. So the reason that we're excited about this, and you can go to Focus on Exceptional Children, volume 49, pages 1 through 14, and you can read the literature, right? Those of you who are excited about looking at uh, the statistics. So we can, we can cover some of that. Part of what I want you to take away from that, part of what we're learning, part of what we're learning is this whole notion of implementation stages. Now this is a slide that Steve Goodman from Michigan has done. And this is work that has come from uh, Steve Goodman, from Dean Fixon, and Karen Blasey at the University of North Carolina. And you can download these with color and with all of the pieces, either from our website or from the, the North Carolina website. Here's what I want you to think about. And, and I don't want to make this too complicated. The real message is simple. Don't assume that implementing something in your school is simply getting the binder and doing the sexy trick. I want you to think about implementation always in this format. Never have an individual implement. Always implement with a team. Never have the team operate without an administrator. So you need administrative and team function, saying, is this something we want to bring in? Implement things at the whole school level. But when you do it, start by saying, is this something we need? Not is this something we like. Is this something we really need? And focus on the core features. I'm going to come back to the core features in just a minute. If you say, we need this and this will work, then say, let's get it right. So let's get the, found the installation part. Do we have the teaming structure, the data system, the policies, the organization to make it work? If you're doing PBS, don't start teaching kids behavioral expectations until you've developed a team, you have actually built a teaching matrix, you vetted that both with your faculty, your families, and if they're middle school or high school, with the kids. Go through that process. Build community. Build community with your science. If you do that, then when you actually do the initial implementation, it'll work. Now, if you are getting started, part of what you'll find is you're going to get one or two schools or one or two classrooms that just go brilliantly. Use those to figure out how to go to scale. But you will not be able to go to scale unless you've implemented the foundation pieces that actually make it go. If you get something in place, here's the other big message. Things sustain. Things keep working only if you continuously make them better. There's this concept called continuous regeneration. You don't, and, and think of it this way. Have you ever seen, you've seen that poster that kids have of the, the cat that is hanging on with its claws, right? And, and it talks about sustaining. That is not what sustaining is, <laughs> all right? Sustaining isn't hanging on. It isn't doing exactly what we did last year. In fact, I was in, I was in one meeting in a, uh, in a middle school, in a middle school actually in Iowa, and I said, why are we doing it this way? And the guy said, well, it's dit willy. I said, it's what? He said, it's dit willy. It's did it that way last year. <laughs> and part of what I want you to do is I want you to move beyond that. If we're going to do it well, I want you to keep coming back. Is this the most efficient and effective strategy we can put in place? How do we make things work? The deal is, as leaders, I want you to make it more efficient. I want to make it easier to do things well than to move around. So if you're running a district, all right, you're in a district, I want you to think about this. The old way is we would have a district leader, and she would say, all right, go ye forth and create local demonstrations that make me look good, <laughs> right? And, and that would be, essentially, you'd have a picture that only had those two parts to it. Right? It had the district leadership team, and then it had local demonstrations. 
Here's what we're learning. Remember, I want you to put things in place that'll last for a minimum of how long? 10 years. All right, if you're gonna do that, what does it take? Here's what it takes. I want you to be able to identify the funding and be able to say, how are we gonna be able to sustain this for a minimum of three years at any point in time? How are we gonna sustain this for a minimum of three years? What does it cost to implement school-wide positive behavior support? Very little. It takes, on average, about $7,000 per school to get it in place. It takes less than $1,000 a year to sustain it, okay? That is, by education standards, cheap. Okay, now, if you're gonna do that, to what extent are we creating visibility? Does every faculty member, student, and family know what we do? By October 1st, by October 1st, can your families tell you what the behavioral expectations are? Does the school board know what the behavioral expectations are? Is it in a newsletter? Is it on a website? Is it on the back of the kids? Is it on the t-shirts? Is it on the PA system? Is it on the windows? This is not eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper tacked to the wall. I want it painted on the wall. Got it? So you got visibility. Do you actually have the political support? If you are actually implementing something of importance, the school board should ask you how you're doing at least twice a year. And when they ask, they should say, are you doing what you said you would do? Show me a fidelity measure. Is it benefiting children? And I want you to tell me the answer to that within 15 minutes. I don't want a chorus. I don't want a whole bunch of people standing and shouting. I want you to show me the numbers. That's what we do if we're doing this well. The other thing is policy, okay? I want you to think. To what extent in your district is there a policy that says the social behavior of children is one of the core accomplishments of our district? We expect people to graduate with the skills to be effective citizens. The academic skills, the social skills to be able to move forward and accomplish what they need. If you don't have that as a policy, to what extent are we holding everything else? I mean, think about it. You've got school improvement plans or you've got um, something equivalent to a school improvement plan that you have to do, right? And your school improvement plan almost for sure has something related to math and or reading. To what extent does it also have something that says the social behavior of children is something that's a core feature? I want you to come, I mean, come on. That is something you're being held accountable for. If you are being held accountable for it, take it to your district and say, come on, Cowboys, why are we not putting this in sequence? or you say it however is appropriate in whatever part of the district you're from. <laughs> All right, now, when, here's what I also want you to do. As a teacher, as a teacher, if you are implementing, as a school psychologist, if you are assisting implementation, if you are a social worker, counselor, administrator, special educator, and somebody is saying, we want to implement effective literacy, we want to improve the writing skills, we want to actually change, we want to change the social culture of this environment. Here's what it takes. I want you to be able to say, how do we get the training? And let's not fly people in from Connecticut to do the training. We're gonna do the training over and over. Are we building the capacity to do it here, right? So I want you to be saying for our district, even if you've got a small district, if you've got a small district, are you using your SELPA? Are you using the county? How are you getting the capacity to be, if this is gonna last for 10 years, we can't afford to fly people in for 10 years. We can fly people in for two. At the end of 24 months, you gotta be able to have people who can actually do the training. And if the people you fly in don't train you how to do the training, they are not following the rule, okay? So I want you to build the capacity. I want, if somebody's gonna come and implement early math, tell me, within two years, who's gonna be able to do the training within your district? Second is don't ever train somebody to do something unless they have the coaching to pull it off. Coaching involves somebody showing up. And the key things about coaching, one, a coach allows you to adapt key ideas to your local context. A coach allows you to say, how does this work when you've got 70% of your kids are English language learners? How does it work when you've actually got, you've got in your classroom, Elliot, and all you have to do in your school is say, Elliot is in my class, <laughs> and everybody looks down and feels sorry for you, right? Okay, no, seriously. Now, how do you do it, how do you do it if 40% of the families 
actually come from a very focused religious background. How do you make something work so it fits your context? A coach helps you to stay focused on the core features and make the other elements adapt. If you're in an environment where for 450 years the elders have taught what the core values are, use their core values. How do you make it fit? You got it? All right. Second thing that a coach does, a coach provides the prompts to keep you on target. This whole, a coach will help you to do the fidelity measure. A coach will tie you in with both the district, the county, and the state initiatives. A coach is your conduit to solutions. If you've got a problem, I want you to take it to your coach. If she can't solve it, I want her to take it to Barb, Kelly, and Christy. If they can't solve it, they send it to us and we will find you an answer. Part of what makes this work is your back is covered. We don't have all the answers, but we will scour the globe. I mean, we have access to the best people, not just in the country, but in the world. And we will get you what you need, okay? But don't call George first, right? Call your coach, work through, all right? Third thing that the coach does, the coach will help us to move forward in terms of linking with all of, the other, all of the other schools and districts. So the coach provides conduit, the coach keeps us honest, the coach keeps us connected. That's what coaching does. I gotta tell you, most of the coaching is done by counselors, social workers, special educators, school psychologists. Coaching is, quite frankly, the most fun role, okay? It is a blast. So if you can, Get yourself embedded in being a coach. If you're a teacher, right now, if you're doing early literacy in RTI, if you're doing math, if you're doing behavior support, I want you to think, right? Upper right-hand corner, I want you to write down the name of your coach. If you don't have that, by April 15, right? On your tax form, I want you to write, who is my coach? <laughs> okay, third, expertise. And this is designed around the behavior part. But if you're going to do this well, you need to be able to identify the, ex the, the um, as you move up the triangle, right? For the red part of the triangle, the, the yellow parts of the triangle, you actually need more intensity. When, you do, when you've got a kid who's having difficulty reading, what are you actually learning? When you have a kid who has real difficulty reading, I mean, I gotta tell you, some of the stuff that is just a blast, there's a woman named Beth Harn at the University of Oregon who's working with the neuropsych folks, and she looked at a group of 45 five-year-olds, and she actually wired them up, right? So they were, they were doing fMRIs, they were actually looking, we were looking at their neural patterns as they were being introduced to early, early text. And she identified the seven kids who were really having difficulty with the alphabetic, the segmentation part. She could, and there's two parts that are really exciting. Thing number one, we could measure using your measures which kids were having difficulty. Two, we can actually describe the neural structure that separates those kids from other kids, right? And what she's doing right now is she's using a set of attention training routines that a guy named Posner built. And our bet is that we can actually teach those kids to attend better if we can by the time they're seven and move to California, they will be able to read. Now, is that a blast? Okay, don't say, okay, now what, I, I saw somebody over here at table 19 who's writing down, buy an fMRI machine for this, you know, don't do that. But what I want you to do is I want you to get the sense that things are happening and things are possible. The other part, one of the things that we miss, I gotta tell you, all right, this is real. If we're really serious about using data for decision making, I want you to look at your district and say, come on, where's the evaluation unit within the district? Who is identifying the progress monitoring tools, the universal screening tools? Who is helping us? Don't ask teachers to reinvent the wheel every time. Do we have a district structure for making this work? And the answer is, yes, we do. We do, we actually, come on, we can save you a huge amount of time. Now here's the rule. Here's the rule, you ready? It should take less than 1% of staff time to collect, summarize, and use the data. Less than 
All right? My older brother was one of the 100 top executives for Hewlett Packard. He was in charge of looking at the, the safety structures or the, um, the error patterns within what Hewlett Packard did. They collected, used, summarized their data within 1%. They were collecting much more complicated stuff than we are. They also spent a whopping lot more than we do. All right? We can, the, but the point is, you, the point that I'm trying to get is we actually know how to do this already. We keep, as teachers, we keep absorbing all of the role. Part of what I want you to start thinking about is I want you to do it differently. Now this, I gotta love, listen, this is, this is to actually get a little bit of heart rate increase. I want you to be excited about this. <clears throat> this is the slide I want you to all download and use. And every time you do it, see the little name on the right hand side, Steve Goodman. All right, so here you go. See where it says district. This is the district and the stages of implementation. You've got the exploration stage, the installation stage, the initial development of examples, elaboration in the sustainability structure. And so you've got the district. Now, you get model schools. So you start with model schools. Those are the schools that are going to be your exemplars. And they usually start by just getting the tier one levels, the green level, right? They get that in place. Once you've got once you've got those schools in place, then here's what I want you to do. That's when you say, okay, how do we then take that? But because as we built the universal supports, we also built training and coaching capacity. Never build the examples without simultaneously building the training and coaching capacity. Now as a district, now as a district, those of you in the yellow cog, right? Now that you've got both the idea, and you've got some examples, that sets you up to be able to use those to scale up. So you've got 10 schools, you can go to 30, but use those 10 schools. Each time you do it, however, here's the thing I want you to remember. Just because you have done exploration doesn't mean school nine has done exploration. Give them the honor and the responsibility and the respect to be able to do it on their own. But as you start scaling up with more schools across the district, I want you to go back to those model schools and add the yellow and red parts. And then you add those. And when you get all the stuff in place, it all turns. Is that neat? <laughs> I get no credit other than I can push the button. All right. All right, so now here we go. You ready? Now we're gonna go a little bit faster. I'm gonna create one problem and then I'm gonna walk you through the 14 and eight. One problem and then we will go through the 14 and eight. We've got half an hour. So the problem. The problem is we end up trying to do too many things. Remember I talked about we, and within, within the schools that I was a teacher for, that was definitely true, within the schools in California that I work with. I currently work with San Jose, I currently work with some small districts, Campbell and Oak Grove near San Jose. Part of what I see over and over again is I see people inundated with uh, not just doing behavior support, but doing character education, doing bully prevention, doing too many things, all of which are really tied together. Here's the big idea. Almost all of the strategies and initiatives you've got have good ideas. You ver at this point, you're not doing very many things that are bad ideas. The problem is the overlap among the things you're doing is hidden because everybody wants to market their idea. Don't do that. If it's gonna work for you, I want you to do a smaller number of things brilliantly. I want you to do a small number of things brilliantly. And the key things that you're gonna do, always start by preserving what you do well. Never stop doing what already works. Focus on the core features. What is it really? I mean, can you tell me the five things that are critical? Don't tell me everything. Tell me the five things that are critical. Very seldom does the specific form that somebody gives you, very seldom is that form critical. It's really the features Add the smallest number of changes that will produce the biggest effect for kids. 